Thank you for tuning in to the February 2019 Q&A. You have Ian and I. Anyone at the Patreon level of $5 and above are able to ask questions for the Q&A. We still have to curate them because we get a zillion of them every time, and these are always really long, so let's just get started. Um, there are two here. that uh, There are more than two, but I put two of them here, about the Franklin Armory thing and SHOT Show. Um, so we've got one from Sean G, which said, What happened at the SHOT Show at Franklin Army that they wouldn't talk to InRange? And then Robert P. says, what's the story with Franklin Armory at the SHOT Show this year? Were you denied complete access or just media coverage? And it goes deeper than that. But So what happened is we walk over there, and they have this new gun. It's what they call the, I don't even remember, the DA pistol thing. Um, it's not Reformation. It is no, that's the old one. Providence. The Providence. The Providence. Providence, yep. So what it is, is I come to find out, is you pull the trigger, and it actually cycles the bolt the whole time. It's like a double-action pistol caliber carbine. And it's supposed to not be a semi-automatic. Anyways, we go over there to talk about it. We walk into the booth on the SHOT Show and um, uh, start to bring out a camera. And there's a guy there. And, and I'm like, we'd like to talk about the new, the new rifle or the new Providence. And he says, oh, we're not filming in the booth. And I said, oh, okay. And I go put the camera away. And then he pointed right at me. He said, and we're supposed to specifically not supposed to talk to you. I didn't like that. And I, I said something I shouldn't have. Um, I said, is it because you're liars? Um, and then they said to leave the booth, which I did. I should not have done that. I apologize for that. However, um, then they then later on had a conversation with another channel talking about what happened. Well, it turns out there had been a bit of a miscommunication. Yeah, I think so. In that the president of Franklin Armory had instructed the booth staff that they weren't supposed to talk to us, not because nobody's supposed to talk to us, but because he wanted to talk to us directly. Like, if InRange is going to film anything here, I want to do it myself personally. Yes. Which would have been very different than we're supposed Which to is, not talk to you. Exactly. Anyways, and then and then there's this this other video that comes out in which the president states that we filmed them last year and put the cap on the camera and then continued to... Uh, that's not what happened. So you were talking to the rep about the gun, which was the, the uh, ref reformation, mm -hmm. and you asked a whole bunch of questions, and frankly the, question, the answers were quite strange. Um, and I had questions I still had, but at that time it was just you and I, and I was filming, and I still had questions, so the conversation never stopped. I just put the camera down to my side of my leg, and we had an audio conversation with the rep that was contiguous and continuous with the interview that you had already been doing. And it even says in the video, the audio, conti or the conversation continued. There was no gotcha in it. There was no gotcha. The guy knew that we were continuing to talk to him with no stop. There was never an issue of, please stop talking to me, or don't ask these questions, or are you recording this? There was never a break in that. The only thing that happened is the camera went to my side, so we could have an audio conversation, and the questions and answers that he continued to answer were still interesting. The president went on to say that it appears that we had played a gotcha, and it covered the scope, or covered the camera lens, and that wasn't what happened. Keep in mind, it, they have a very, very crowded, busy booth. Yes. And keeping distance required for filming, you know, so you have a space between, you know, mm -hmm. gets difficult. Um, in particular, last year, with the, all of the hype that they had built up around the Reformation, the, that booth was packed. It was. So. so that's what happened, is it was, I had questions that you just hadn't asked, and I want, if you, if you watch the video, you'll see that it's just a continuation of the conversation. There's not a break in it. And so I can understand where they maybe thought that that was deceptive, but it wasn't. It, and, and it's a public booth and a public show about talking to the public. We ended up talk. we actually ran into the president of Franklin Armory in the hall at yeah. SHOT Show the next morning. Um, and, and we had a, a conversation with him and he offered to, to talk to us directly himself and, and make something happen. And honestly, at that point, we just didn't want to deal with Franklin mm -hmm. any further. Yep. Like, there's, I am skeptical, but I'm more interested in this year's thing than last year's thing. Last year's thing, I think, was a joke. Um, but I'm not so interested in it that I'm willing to take a situation that's already gone weirdly sideways like this yeah. and and spend a whole lot more mental energy on it. Oh. So if, if the opportunity comes up, I think we'll end up getting one without going through Franklin. Yeah. Like, we'll just have a, an FFL friend buy one. Um, for us, or we'll get one loaned from someone else who buys one, and then we'll do some tinkering with it and do a video on it. Um, it is a potentially interesting idea. Like, I think it legitimately doesn't meet the definition of semi-automatic in the federal statute. There, there are questions then about, is it considered semi-automatic in other countries? I don't know. Um, in some states, perhaps? I don't know. And that's something we would need to get into. You need a lawyer or someone that plays one on TV for that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I will agree with you that the product that they came out with this year is potentially more compelling 
from the perspective of what their goals are. It at least doesn't require an ATF approval to take interstate. No, no well, of course, granted. So the it, Reformation came out with a uh, an interesting ATF ruling on whether or not it's an NFA item. Yeah, it did. So, so here's the thing that's even more weird about this is that when the Reformation thing happened last year, you were, I, I think, in my opinion, between us, you were more skeptical than even I was, actually. And I actually, skeptical's putting it nicely. No, no, I reached out to them, and there's there is content on Facebook as that we put publicly, in which I emailed them saying, you know, these are interesting claims. I don't know. I have no idea if these special projectiles work this way or not. If you send us one, we will put this thing through the test. We'll run through soap. We'll do it at distance. We'll see if it keyholes, and we'll run it at a match and put it on the clock. And their, and their initial response was, that sounds great. They'll and then, never do it now, though. Well, no, they won't. But then I emailed them back later. I'm like, are you going to do this? And they're like, nah. And they just stopped replying. Well, I'm pretty sure that's because their special ammo turned out to be impossible to produce in any sort of quantify or well, cost-effective and, and production-efficient way. That's certainly possible. But when we went in the booth and we had that reaction, I did not really expect there to be any type of bad vibe no. there at all. I really didn't. Because I don't feel like we did anything besides ask them legitimate questions. Got some sometimes illegitimate or really odd answers. I don't think there are a lot of people at SHOT Show asking them legitimate questions. I think there are a lot of people fawning. Well, if we did anything wrong, we, the, we, the only thing we did was ask legitimate questions. I regret nothing. Nothing! I don't either. And um, as we're blowing up in the booth, that's quite dis that's a bit of an exaggeration. You now know exactly what happened. And um, them saying that we were deceptive in our video processes or practices last year is false. Or at least... Not false, a misperception would be the way I'd put it. So that's what it is. Let's go to something more interesting. Moving on. Troy M., if you could only buy guns from one manufacturer, who would you pick? Hmm. That's, that's really hard. Ooh. Boy, you know what? So I don't really care much about shotguns. Right. I'm assuming this is. Ground rules. This is modern guns, like new production. Um, yeah, it must because be. Yeah. As a French collector, naturally, I must say Saint-Tien. Okay, let's go. With, let's go with modern. Let's assume modern. Yeah. Um, you know what? I'd actually say HK. Because <laughs> I don't really care about shotguns, so that's, yeah, that's a good like, answer. I'm not buying new shotguns. Yeah. Pistols. Uh, yeah. The the P7 is pretty awesome. Although um, they don't make that now. No, but um, it's. I'm, I'm taking a little bit of liberty here. Sure. What, what manufacturer's guns would you have? That are still a company in business. Um, but, you know, even aside from those, the USP, I think a lot of the modern service pistols are pretty much interchangeable, and the USP is as good as anything else. I agree. Um, the MP5 is the best submachine gun out there. Yep. The G3 is pretty nice. The G36 is also quite nice, and if you want an AR, they make a 416. Uh -huh. It's a little heavy, but... It's, it's it is still a durable, brutally durable gun. It's an excellent rifle. And even, like, their MG4 and MG5, I haven't had a chance to shoot them, but everything I've seen looks pretty good on those. Like, I don't, you'd have a hard time going wrong with H and K. It's interesting, because I, when I, I, I saw these questions, when I saw that one before you did, I thought to myself, boy, that's hard. And, you know, it's funny, from a civilian perspective, and just a person that enjoys shooting, I actually, and this, people are going to go shilling, but it's not. My first answer that popped in my brain was Brownells. <laughs> because I'm enjoying the retro gun so much. Okay. But that's not the vo that's yeah. not the that's not quite what they're looking that's for. That's not there. the spirit of this. So I'm just saying the first thing that popped in my head was that. But then the second two that popped in my brain after that um, was actually HK and FN. You don't have a whole lot of options for current manufacturers that make a wide variety of high quality guns. Yeah. FN certainly does. Yeah. Um, I mean you could get yourself a scar. 16 or 17. Yeah. They have excellent pistols. Yeah. And that's kind of what you're looking for. It's kind of the same answer as HK, just from a little bit different angle. Um, SIG would be another option. Yeah. SIG has great pistols. SIG has good rifles. We're not talking SIG USA. We're I, talking actual SIG Sour. I've you know, never the, been a big fan of the SIG pistols, but that's just me. Okay. There's nothing Again, wrong with I them. Again, I consider they, they seem to be kind of interchangeable. There's nothing wrong with them. Uh, I just don't yeah. care for them, but that's personal preference. Um, but... To me, HK just kind of has a little bit of unique flavor that I like. You know what's sad is that neither of us even thought of an American company. Oh, no. Wouldn't be Colt. Wouldn't be Remington. Wouldn't be Winchester. Not today. No. That's a shame. The best things they make are reproductions of the things that were good 50 or 100, 150 years ago. They came at it with Belgians and you came at it with Germans. Yeah. Yeah, but I think FN and I think SIG, FN, and HK all provide excellent solutions to all the things you may want to solve. Yeah. So... One of yeah. those three? 
Interesting question. It is. Brian B. Was there any actual competition to the Winchester rifle for civilian use in the late 1800s? Yeah. There's some. Marlin made some guns. Yeah. Um, Whitney. Uh, Whitneyville Armory. There was the Colt Burgess of, in small numbers. Yeah. Although Colt made a gentleman's deal with Winchester to stop making them. Right. There were there were absolutely competitors to the Winchester lever rifle in other lever action rifles. Yes. So, yeah. The Burgess. Um, like I said, I mean, the Marlin guns are good. However, They're still around today. Yeah, they are, and so and so are the Winchesters. But while the Win, well, it's it's like imagine this. It's like the Winchester lever action rifle of the late 1800s is the AR-15 of today. They were prolific, common, and fantastic. There were others, mm -hmm. like maybe you get a Scar 16, but you're the oddball. But everybody's yeah. like, oh, that guy's got to have the weird one. So he might have the Burgess or the whatever, and yeah, or the Marlin. Mm -hmm. um, but the Wit, the the Winchester was the the standard. And if Winchester had licensed the manufacture of that, there would have been what there was with the AR-15 today, or is with the AR-15 today, of everyone making that gun. Right, and but, Winchester would have gone out of business. But they didn't do that smartly, and so they maintained control over their own rifle. But they really had the best answer at the time. Yeah. But there were the others, absolutely. Benjamin R. Is there a major advantage to ceramic plate with Kevlar behind it versus AR-500 with a thick layer of anti-spall coating for body armor? Yeah, ceramic plate's lighter. Not just that, it's... it's And better. It is. AR-500 is heavy. It's really heavy. And then that spall coating helps, but I don't know... We, there actually is a video on in-range. You weren't in this one. I did it with um, uh, Matt from Primary and Secondary and Dugan from Carnicon, mm -hmm. and we shot AR-500 um, for spall testing. And honestly, it did a much better job than I expected, but there was still an occasional errant piece of fragment that went in disturbing directions. Um, it's possible. And so... Um, that said, the uh, ceramics or ceramic hybrids are lighter, they do the job, and while you have to be a little more careful with them in terms of how you handle them, um, I would much rather have those than AR-500. But the AR-500 with spall coating, if you're willing to take the weight hit, um, I think most of the time it does the job. If you're really concerned, you can throw some Kevlar in it. You could, Kev you, you, you could put Kevlar around it. Yeah. If you were to put Kevlar around an AR-500 plate, you would then mitigate that issue. The spall coating is like a poor man's way of putting some Kevlar around the AR-500. Yeah. So, yeah, the major advantage is weight. And spalling. Uh, this is a weird one. I guess this, we can answer this one quickly. Mm -hmm. Adam W., did you gents get into fisticuffs at Chacho this year? No. Nope. I don't even know where that comes from. Thomas B., are there any particular precautions that you take to prevent moon dust from gumming up your guns and particularly your magazines? Nope. I'm going to say yes. Okay. Um, uh, with an AR-15, for example, it's always wise when you're m meandering about to have the dust cover closed. True. Um, having a magazine inserted in an environment where you can makes sense. It's the same with pistols. Um, however, I think what is more relevant to this isn't how you handle the gun, but how you handle your magazines and how you put them in the pouches. Mm -hmm. So pouches that are protective in that regard, especially ones that are flapped, or seal tightly around it, like tacos do a pretty good job of this too, but tacos can get dirty from the sides. Yeah. A flap holster that's a pouch where you flap over it um, is going to keep a lot of garbage out of your magazines and keep your uh, ammunition down instead of up, obviously. Right. So that's about it. But I think yeah. the storage method of carrying them matters more than anything. Yeah. Ferris, what are your thoughts on both? This is interesting because this came out, your video about the Bond Boberg just came out, and this was before that. So Ferris asks, what are your thoughts on bullpup pistols like the Boberg and now Bond Arms 9? It's cool. It's really cool. Why is it cool? It's got a rear feed, a totally unique magazine, and it's a rotating barrel. That like, sounds like bad. Got, See, that sounds like bad. <laughs> How is that cool? It sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. Cool and a disaster waiting to happen are in no way... Ah, okay. So we're, the we're disassociating the two. Yeah, it's super cool. Mechanically fascinating. Yes, exactly. It's a gun nerd's dream pistol. See, I will say the C96 is mechanically fascinating, but it's a dumpster fire of a gun. Now, I think dumpster fire is a bit of a harsh description. For, for a the, C96? For the Boberg? No, I'm not. Okay, let me yeah. correct this. I'm yeah. saying the C96 is a dumpster fire. It works when it works, but it's a crazy gun. The Boberg is not a dumpster fire. I'm not saying that. The Boberg, however, it does have potential issues. Yes. And it, the problem with the Boberg is... The justification for all the complexity mm. is scant. It is, you get a barrel length that's, you basically, you get a free inch of barrel length. 
which means you get a little extra velocity. Yeah. Which means if you're shooting hollow points, you get a little bit better expansion or better penetration. Maybe. But, well, no, you legitimately do. Because you're getting an extra inch of barrel. How much of an inch of barrel on a pistol is really well, a velocity increase? I mean, when you talk about a bullpup yeah. rifle with 5.56, five, when you go from a 10-inch barrel to a 20-inch barrel or whatever that you can do on a bullpup, you're talking about a very dramatic velocity mm -hmm. increase. This is the sort of thing where you're going from 2 to 3 or 3 to 4. 100 I mean, feet per second, maybe? As a... As a percentage of barrel length, it is very significant. Granted, what exactly that translates to, we could look it up, but I haven't. Yeah. Um, the question is just like, is that worth it? Is it that much easier to carry? And does it justify, most importantly, does it justify the complexity of the gun? So um, there are a lot of people who are diehard fans of them. I think they're super cool, but uh, I don't know if I'd carry one. I would but that doesn't mean I wouldn't want to have one. Okay, so I think that they're very... I, I agree they're mechanically interesting. The ones that I've seen and handled have been well-made. It's not an issue at all. If you get the right ammunition, that doesn't have the issue of pulling the projectile out of the cartridge when it's seating. Right. That can all be mitigated. Mm -hmm. But I really, really have a hard time thinking an inch of barrel pistol, pistol barrel, makes a difference. I think... I I'm kind of have adopted fundamentally this attitude that how cool a gun is and how practical it are, it is, are inversely proportional. The cooler it gets, usually the less practical it gets. And that makes me just at a gut level concerned about the Boberg. See, the alternative to this, and we both agree on this, the P7, which is no longer in production, is cool as heck and eminently practical. Yes. It's a fantastic pistol. Yeah. The Boberg is cool. I find it to be very dubious in its goals and need. Yeah. Uh, that inch, I have a hard time with that. Just yeah. an inch of pistol. The barrel. P7 brings something legitimate to the table. Yeah. That inch of barrel is... Questionable. Yeah. I, I, how many angels dance on the head of a pin is yeah. what the Boberg is a little bit. All right, what do we have next? Okay, we got two What Would Stoner Do questions. Okay. We'll start with the first one. Anthony B. After a year of tuning up What Would Stoner Do Carbine and going back to switching other rifles for each match, do you miss the consistency of the What Would Stoner Do Carbine? I don't know about consistency. I miss the awesomeness of it sometimes. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, it's, it, it is my favorite gun that I own. Um, it is my most practical gun that I own, and yeah, there are times when, well, like we just did Desert Brutality, yep. and I would have done so much better on a lot of those stages mm -hmm. with a What Would Stoner Do carbine. Yep. It's, I still, I very much enjoy shooting older and weirder guns, but every once in a while you like to just shoot fast and look awesome, <laughs> and, and Stoner <laughs> Carbine's really good at that. It is, and when you pick these things up, it's like once you get used to the weight of the, the Stoner build, when you pick something else up, you're like, God, these things are a brick. Yeah. They really feel like a brick. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, they shoot well, they're very accurate, and they're extremely light. What else do you want? Yeah. Tim, in looking at parts from my own What Would Stoner Do rifle, I saw there are drop-in triggers with a flat trigger or curved trigger. What's the difference? Well, first of all, the What Would Stoner Do build did standardize on the SLT-1 from KE Arms for a number of reasons. One, it's an excellent trigger. It got rid of the um, disconnector? Is that the word? Yes. The disconnector and um, it also therefore mitigating that issue it's also a sealed unit for dirt and debris and it allows you to put the safety on when you're in either hammer up or down right. which are all the reasons we went for that in terms of the benefits of a flat or curb trigger i think it's truly legitimately nothing more than personal preference i'm really glad to hear you say that because mm -hmm. i was trying to figure out what on earth the practical application is some people find that they're more consistent with the flat trigger okay um i don't think there's a mechanical advantage or anything i think it's just strictly preference okay so, but in Good terms enough. of the guns, we did we did standardize on the SLTs, and they do the make SLT them. The SLT two is a flat trigger, isn't it? The SLT one, yes. The SLT one is curved, and the SLT yeah. two is is flat. So you can make, you can still go with an SLT, just go one or two, and yeah. you get either or, and you get all the benefits of the SLT in the package. Desert brutality and competition. Sean P. I had the best time at Desert Brutality 2019, and I told my wife it was like Christmas. Thank you. The likelihood of Desert Brutality 2020 returning to SUPS, which is the range we ran it at this year in southern Utah. We don't know. Yep. Probably? Probably. At this point? But SUPS was really happy with the match. We yep. were very happy with SUPS. Yeah, they did a great job running it. They really did. It's a great facility and good people and good staff with the right mindset. So there's a pretty good chance, I'm going to say high likelihood, that it would be SUPS. Um, we're also talking about some other potential things as well. Yeah. Uh, but SUPS is a very high likelihood. The Nowhere Man. In what ways did the intermediate and below cartridge requirements at Desert Brutality 2019 venue affect stage design 
compared to your past events. So for the audience that doesn't understand this, um, at the SUPS range in southern Utah, due to county restrictions, did not allow anything greater than an intermediate cartridge. 7.62 by 39 or 8 Kurds, although nobody had 8 Kurds. It almost happened. I heard someone was going to bring a Sturmgewehr and quite didn't make it. We came close to having a Sturmgewehr. Yeah. Yep. So, um, so, so as a result, did it change our design? Not Honestly, it really didn't change the stages. What it changed was our decision on how to classify, on how to define the classic division. Yeah. Because there were going to be no major caliber battle battle rifles, mm. um, the classic division end date was moved from 1974 to 1986. Essentially, we moved it up so that you could bring like an M16A2 clone right. and still be in classic. So what we did is we made the scope of intermediate cartridge chambered rifles broader. Um, in terms of what it did to stage design, absolutely nothing. Yeah. Stage design is not based on the gun. This is the thing that's fascinating about uh, what we do with two-gun in general and Desert Brutality, is that the stage design is not based around any particular gun. The, uh, we have a litmus test that I always like to talk about, which that the stages should be completable with an AKM, a stock AKM, and that's the only requirement. So how that affects whether or not there are 308s there or not, it doesn't. The only place it would have made a difference was the one stage with a rifle spinner. Yep which would have been substantially simpler with a 308, but no big deal. Actually, if, you know, honestly, if anything, not having 308s allowed kind of helped balance that stage out. That's true, although I will say this, because I, I shot an AKM in 760 by 39 and I don't know that it would have helped, and here's why. Um, the uh, On the, the Casarda drill, it was the spinner target, and so when you threw the kettlebell and when you landed, you had to shoot the bottom plate of the spinner. Mm -hmm. And then you threw the kettlebell and got, and then you shoot the bottom plate of the spinner. Um, with 556, five, one hit on the bottom plate just kind of makes it wiggle. When and I shot it, and it's pretty much stopped by the time you get to the point of shooting it. The when next I time. shot my 760 by 39 gun, when I got down prone at my next position, the thing was still swinging. So I actually that makes it a little harder. So what it actually was harder, and I had to wait for it to be visible to engage it. That said, you crushed it at the end when you had to spin it. Huge benefit at the end when I actually had to spin it. Yes, but if it was 308, guess what? I think that would have been a little worse. If you were fast enough, it's entirely possible you could have gotten to the end and basically had it already spinning. Probably. But it would have been very hard to engage it while moving from firing point to yeah, firing point. So it, point. it wasn't necessarily better to have more mass until the very end. Right. Um, Jorge R. Most two-gun events are just three-gun minus the shotgun. How can we continue to spread genuine 2G ACM with physical and marksmanship challenges? Tell people that's what you want. Yep. Uh, be, be, uh, be the difference. <laughs> no, but, but show up, explain it, send the video, share a video. Here's a match that I liked stages I saw in. And by the way, we're not the only ones that are doing cool stages. Yeah. If you find matches or stages that you think are cool, share them. Um, go to your match director and go, hey, can we do something like this? Yeah. Um, that's what I would encourage. Yeah. So, and what we're doing, right? Come to Desert Brutality and uh, be part of the cause. Glenn W., for two gun and other competition shooting, do you prefer a red dot or reflex? And would you be interested in a flip over magnifier? change that preference or would a flip over magnifier change that preference i feel like we've kind of addressed this with the what would stoner do stuff yeah he may not um, have seen that what that's unacceptable yeah you should watch everything right okay every uh, video twice i haven't really messed with reflex sites much i don't like them um would someone consider the e-attack a reflex site no okay Ref obviously someone would not consider the e-attack a reflex site I mean, yep. obviously to me reflex sites are like the obser is a reflex site you hate the Obzor. No, I like the Obzor. That's the Russian one that's decent. Right, it's the other one. It's, never mind. The PKAS right. is yeah. terrible. Um, but, but like, for example, uh, a, um, Trijicon has that reflex site yeah. where you got to, and you have to set that, you have like a little polarity dial to make it yeah, darker. Yeah, and that's right. They're just harder to pick up. Um, okay. And I feel like they're harder to focus on. I know focus isn't the word. You look through them to see the target, and the reflex reticle should just appear. But a red dot is just faster, better, easier, clear, cleaner. cleaner it seems to picture. do everything that's necessary in a smaller footprint. Yep, yep, yep. And so. while, while it has the need of a battery, yeah, these things, especially with aim points, last essentially in perpetuity. They last longer than the battery lasts. So, weirdly, whatever. Yeah. yeah, so red dot. Michael R., you both love the Garand, but why not so much the M14? Uh, the magazines are not very good mm -hmm. in the M14. Um, the gas system is not really an improvement, and basically the M14 should have been a far better gun than it actually is. By the time the M14 was developed, it was already obsolete. Were you going to use the oh, O word? I was going to use the word obsolescent. It wasn't obsolete because yeah. it's still a viable gun, but it was already behind the curve. Yeah. The other problem with the M14 was the actual production. 
there were massive quality control problems in the production of the M14. Um, that really, I mean, that that's as much a, I think an issue as the actual gun itself. When you have, when you look at why did it, why was it such a short-lived rifle in the U.S. military? I don't. Well, it's still around. Not really. In specialized roles. But but such a short-lived standard issue. I, I personally also find I know people go it's a training issue, but I personally find seating the magazine those things to be abysmally hard. It's not. I actually watched a video it was on Forgotten Weapons where you were going to fire, you were firing a full auto one, mm -hmm. and no matter what, this is how it, M14 magazine reloads it's always look like this. Click, <laughs> click, like it's always like that, and like well, not always. I'm sure there's someone out there who's like, nope, but but most of the time it's this, find yeah. the thing, and I got to tell you, this is, this isn't a video to do right now because it's not worth it. But it's like I'm, I, it, I always, this is compelling. Could you, could your rate of fire with an M1? surpass that of an M14 after a magazine or two. You could match it, yeah. I think you could. I, I really believe you can match the rate of fire of an M14 with an M1. Which then makes you really wonder, what does this thing bring to the table? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. David P. Was the Mauser C96 concept too weak in action to potentially have been developed into a quote-unquote Sturmgewehr? It was too expensive of a concept, I think, was really the bigger issue. Um, they actually did propose one. They built, in 1917, Mauser had an experimental trench carbine, which was a semi-auto only, uh, detachable mag-fed, intermediate barrel length. They, they had a couple different versions, but 10, 12, maybe 14 inch barrel length, permanently attached stock. Um, what was it chambered in though? 763, uh, no, 9 parabellum. It was. Or 9 parabellum. So the yeah. question when I hear Sturmgewehr, it makes me think, could it could the C96 action handle 8 millimeter quartz? Ew, no. That's just, just, no. When See, yeah, I guess you're right, he did say Sturmgewehr. I heard that and I was thinking uh, Sturmtruppen. Oh! Like, is this... Why not the C90, a version of the C96 as opposed to the artillery Luger and the MP8? So there's, there's more than one way to interpret this question. Yeah. So you could turn it into something more viable than the handgun thingamajig it was. But could the C96, the other part of this, the way I interpreted it was, could it handle an intermediate cartridge? So in theory, you could scale that system up. And the locking system, sure, it would work. Um, but you're ending up with a short recoil rifle, which is not, it's never really been a viable, successful concept. And a, a system that's really designed better to fit into the ergonomic package of a pistol. Not, uh, not just to mention the thing is, a, is literally a mousetrap inside. It is, it is a convoluted gun. If you made it into a rifle, you could dramatically simplify the fire control pieces because mm -hmm. you would have a lot more space to work with. True. But the whole, it's got a locking block that... Yeah, actually, yeah, I think people are going to watch this and ponder on it and realize that the locking system on the C96 with the block that comes up um, and locks into the bolt is actually not that far off of something like a foul. Mm. Um, the foul that you had the bolt moving instead of the locking block moving. But yeah, the C96 was, was better left as a dead end. Like, yeah. learn what we have from the C96 and then start over yeah. and build something that is more suitable and more appropriate in just overall concept. And there's the bolt stop, which cracks and fragments and comes apart and eventually has a, is, can be a dangerous condition. If you were to upscale that, it's going to be a gigantic piece that you'd have to constantly check on. Yeah. I Presumably, if it, were a stern, if it were in a rifle format, you wouldn't have the bolt uh, exiting the back of the receiver. And so you would replace the bolt oh, stop with yeah. the back end of the receiver mm -hmm. with the spring-loaded buffer or something. But it's just really better to start from scratch. I'm going to say I don't think it would have worked. <laughs> but, but, well, in terms of a Sturmtruppen weapon, they were rejected probably on the basis of being um, too expensive. Yeah, they I are. Suspect. Um, a lot of machining in a C96. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Old world design. I mean, think about it. It really was one of the first viable semi-automatic pistols. The thing that it had going for it was Mauser had a far better magazine than the, the artillery Lugers or the Bergmans, the mp they had a fantastic magazine. Oh, you're talking about the detachable magazine yeah. fed one. You're not talking about the standard stripper clip fed. Correct. Yeah, yeah okay. the detachable mags. Double stack, double feed, strong mags. Really good magazine system. Just the rest of the gun wasn't Luger, good Luger enough. mags are pretty bad. Yeah. I mean, they, they can be reliable, but they're a giant nightmare. They're like the C96 pistol. Like, yeah. that's great. You've learned a lot. Now start over and build a proper magazine from the beginning. Fair enough. Jeff W., as people who shoot a lot, how are your blood le lead levels and how often do you get checked? What precautions do you take to stay safe? I've never been checked for my blood lead levels. Have you? 
think I was, uh, but it's been a long time. I never have. Now, we shoot predominantly, and I mean predominantly as in 99% of the time, outside in field conditions. The um, And we're typically shooting jacketed bullets and not a lot of the old stuff, but we shoot old stuff too, lead bullets. Um, lead, this kind of lead induction into your body is, one, it's aerated from firing in closed environments that are not ventilated well, which if you're going to a if you ever go into an indoor range and they have those big blowers that are like Whoa! and all you can hear are the blowers, that's because they need serious ventilation for the airized, atomized lead coming out of the guns. That's one of the reasons. And amongst coming out of the backstops. Amongst others, yes, of course. Um, and then, of course, handling lead bullets or casting. Casting is a more of a bigger concern than it is any kind of shooting. But if you're in outdoor environments like this and you take the simple precaution of washing your hands thoroughly before you eat or drink, I don't think it's really that big of a thing. Not that I'm aware of. We have a friend that works in forensics, and he does shoots indoors all the time, and he has to get checked like by like code, or their their business rules, and his lead levels are slightly elevated, and he's shooting indoor constantly, all the time, handling ammunition and guns constantly all the time. So, if you're an outdoor shooter, I don't think it's a real thing. Yeah. Sean T. I see you guys do a lot of reviews of military firearms, but I haven't seen a review of the M17 or SIG P320. What do you think of the new standard issue service pistol? You had more to say about this than I do. Well, we're both going to say that they're kind of all interchangeable. Um, handguns are not, well, they're not really my forte. Okay. Um, and they're not that important in military service either. And what makes me always a little bit sketchy about looking at some of, some of the guns like this is ultimately what will really determine their quality is going to be a, a long-term sustained yeah. use by the military. And so, like some of the, the commercial guns that come out, the, the Kel-Tex, the Desert Tex, the Robinson Arms, those are probably never going to be adopted by a military force and they're never going to see that sort of long-term statistical level of usage. And so I'm much more comfortable doing some video on that. Like. If it has problems that we find, we can report on those. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, we can report on that. With something like the, the M17, or the SIG 320, in five years, we're going to know everything you need to know about that gun. Just like we did <laughs> with the Beretta M9. By the nature you know, of the beast that it's being run if, through the machine. If we'd done a video review of the Beretta M9 and not noticed that, you know, statistically speaking, whatever percentage of them will crack the back of the slide off after X thousand rounds, I, I don't feel like we're the, we have the, the basis for putting out an expert video on that because the military is going to come up with much better information. The fact that they adopted the gun in the first place pretty much says to me the gun's fine. There may be developmental you know, tweaking issues that they'll come up with over the years, but you know it, it's not a lemon. If, they adop if the military actually adopted it, 99% it, it's fine. Highly unlikely that it wouldn't be, yeah. So it's funny you address this question from the perspective of durability and reliability, and I come at it from the perspective of just practical handling and use. Mm -hmm. And you kind of said this already. Take any of the high-end, high-quality, modern 9mm high-capacity pistols on the market. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Glock, SIG, HK, Beretta. You might have a preference. The might, this one is better for me than the other one, but the reality is... If you're a shooter and you put enough rounds downrange with any of them, they're all going to be fine. Your Ford Focus, your Toyota Corolla, your Honda Accord. So what, when the military says we pick the SIG P320, I'm like, what that really tells you is that's the one that had the best overall cost platform. <laughs> for spare parts, for mags, for ammo, probably. for pistols, yeah. for training, it came down to all these guns probably work just fine. What one is the best economic deal? We mentioned the P7 earlier in this Q&A, and there was a lot of people, there were a lot of police agencies, for example, that wanted the P7, loved them, mm -hmm. but they weren't willing to pay the P7 premium, so they bought something else. Right. And the reality is they didn't hurt themselves no, in doing that. Just fine. P7's a better gun, but better, better. is better. Qu quant what is the quantitative number for the word better? Right. Like, does it shoot reliably? Does it hit where you aim? Does it have the capacity you need? You kind of met the goals, yes. right? Yep. So... Mason H., if you could have brought a lever action to the Western trenches, I'm assuming of World War I, would you have or would you have kept a bolt action? There's a lot of different trenches. That's a tough question. A lot of different lever guns, too. Yeah, some of it depends on what you're doing. If it was going, if I was going to, it would have to be like a 73, I think. Yeah. I don't think I want one of the rifle caliber ones. No, like a 4440? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want the bigger bore ones because. No. 
Um, I don't want a Henry. I don't want an 1860 uh, or a 66. But then 73 is a tricky question. Like, it is a more fragile gun. Ooh. It may not be. Ah, that's, it, a bit, that's a big statement. Uh, I don't. You can smash the magazine tube. You, you can break the magazine tube. You could damage the lever. The lever is easier to damage than the bolt on a rifle. Yeah. Yeah. 73 is pretty well built. It's a pretty rugged gun. It, it's not bad. Yeah. But... But then you get a lot more firepower with it. Especially in a trench raid. Yeah. But it's not always a trench raid. I don't want to try and snipe through a loophole with an 1873 <laughs> instead of a 1917 Enfield. No, but a 73 44 40 can rely, easily, reliably make man size hits at 100 yards or further. Even yeah, it 200. Can. But the sights suck compared to a 1917 Enfield. Well, yeah, but you're taking the best sights of the war when you say that. Sure, because you don't have the option put, for really good aperture sights on the lever. Right? Yeah, but put them up against all the other sight, sighting systems that existed during the war, and now the 73 doesn't look so bad. The P-17 happens to be excellent. Which would be the reason I might happen to take it instead of a Winchester. I don't know. It's a tough question. I would take the lever gun. Okay. Yeah, because most of the engagement distances are less than anyone ever thought they would have been. The 4440 was capable of making it hits at the distances we're talking about. You have, if you have a rifle, you're going to have 13 rounds of capacity on tap. The ability to refill it easily through the King's Gate. Yeah. Minimal recoil, minimal sound and flash signature. It's true. It's quieter. Signature and sound signature is a big deal, or flash and, and, and sound signature. Plus, if it gets into a dire situation where there's enemies coming in your trench or you're raiding the enemy trench, the firepower you would have with that is so much better. Now, the, here's the other question. What about a lever gun versus a pistol and a satchel full of grenades? Storm, the, the stormtroopers were into those. On all sides? Yeah. That's fair. I don't know. Oh, well, you know what? I do know. That's a good... When you say that, I would go with the pistol and the grenades because we've said this before on the channel. Anything semi-automatic is better than anything that isn't. Yeah. And a pistol that's semi-automatic that's reliable is better than anything that isn't. And you could... You actually have more firepower with the pistol you because do. reload a box magazine and you've got... Yep. You, can, you can reload two mags faster than you can... As good as the lever gun is, there's still a disruption to things as you're cycling the action. Yeah. No matter how good you are with it. Yeah. All right. All right. Nicholas B. I included this because it gets asked every month all the time. Okay. Will you mud test your FAMAS? No. Okay. Probably not. Uh, those things have gotten insanely expensive. Yes. And there aren't exactly a lot of spare parts floating around. No. Um, and I just... The mud tests are interesting. That rifle's worth as much as a car. just don't want to. If any of you guys have a FAMAS that you would like to see me mud test, <laughs> I would be happy to borrow it, mud test it. I'll give it to Carl. He'll clean it off fantastically well when we're done. And I'll squirt it down with a hose. It'll <laughs> come back probably with a few little scratches from pebbles in the mud. Yes. And pro almost certainly no additional probably damage. Probably not. Probably not. But, like, for my gun, I, it's just not worth it to me. I understand. Yeah. But it gets asked a lot. Now yeah. you have the answer. So, uh, Nicholas, I'll mud test your FAMAS. Anthony H., do you think 2G ACM would ever become 1G ACM, as in rifle only? Sure. Yeah. We shoot those matches already. Yeah, I have no problem with that. Um, um, not a lot of them, but there are a few. It could happen. There's no reason that we couldn't have, like, one-off, one like, one guns. You know, to be entirely honest, mm -hmm. I think I would probably have more fun at a rifle only match than a, a rifle pistol match mm -hmm. get of the same stage style. I just, I like rifles more than pistols in general. That's because they're harder. Pistols are harder. Oh, they absolutely are. Yeah. Um, the other issue for me is I kind of like the historical cosplay element. Yeah, of course. It's and fun. it's actually difficult to do that properly with rifle and pistol. Because with original gear, if you, were, if you were equipped with a rifle, it's only been pretty darn recently that you also might carry a pistol. All the Cold War stuff, all the old, you know, all the military load-bearing uh, rigs, load -bearing everything. Gear, they're not set up to hold pistols 95% of the time. Yep. So, so it's hard trying to rig up like how do I put my 1911 holster here and now I don't have mag pouches and I've got to take a rifle pouch off to put the mag right. pouch if I can like, get the rifle pouch off I've got this awesome South African pattern 83 combat vest mm -hmm. and I, I used it once and it was in fact at a um, it was the 4th of July match which was rifle, rifle only up only. in Phoenix because the problem is there it goes down to the belt line mm -hmm. it has no attachments for pistol there's yep. no way to hold a pistol in that thing okay. and so I just can't use it in a two gun match so, yes, we absolutely would do that. I don't think the match will become one gun only, but I think there could be, there has been, and should be, certainly no reason not to have an occasional one gun. Yeah. Or even pistol only. 
you could absolutely do pistol only as well. Just totally. Right so it's, yes, it could happen. But it wouldn't change to only that. Bryce D. Do you think the speed of the 1876 lever gun is negated by the reload speed of a bolt gun with charger clips if you're shooting more than 15 rounds? Something that could be tested, actually. But Yeah. Bolt rifle. What's your instinct? If it's not a Mosin, it's probably faster. Over time? Yeah. I think if you just looked at how fast... What, what's the reload time required? Yeah, I think it is. A stripper clip is fast, definitely faster than five rounds in a King's Gate. I agree with that. The only thing the King's Gate brings is that it's easy. If you're moving, you could be shoving rounds in. So you have and, this ability to do an administrative reload while in movement. And you can do it one at a time. Yeah. The problem is if you've got a five-round mag and you shoot three, you can't really use a stripper clip without you, just wasting a couple of the rounds. You could open the bolt, lose a round, and then... And then put it in, but you're going to have one or two left in your clip. Yeah. The King's Gate lets you say, oh, I fired three, clunk, 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 now it's full again. But I think in a, just a straight-up speed race, the, the stripper clips yeah. and the bolt gun would win. Yeah. Chatty P. Many times a bullet tip is used as a disassembly tool or something else. Can rounds detonate from being rough handled? Yes, and absolutely not at the same time. Not the way you're describing. Like using a round like to pry something or as a bullet tip to disassemble or push out an AR-15 pin or something like that. That's not going to be an issue. Rough handling, I have actually seen this happen. Someone, it sounds like not a real thing, and I didn't think it was a real thing until I saw it. Someone dropped a 5.56 round off of a table, and it landed on the concrete on the ground, and it landed just right, and it went off. Yeah, I saw one, one of those happen as well. So that's rough handling. Now, remind, you know, obviously there's no barrel for the bullet to have velocity, to gain velocity going down with the gases that are exploding. However, the round did explode, and it went off like a little tiny grenade. It goes pop, pop. It's like a firecracker, and so little pieces of shrapnel, maybe, would go yeah. in every direction. Generally but, speaking, the bullet stays right where it fell. Yeah, it actually goes... And the cartridge case flies out, because the cartridge case weighs a lot less. So there's little pieces of brass. Yeah. Um, no one got hurt, but it can happen. And be intelligent about this. Um, there was a story a while back, I saw a really horrific picture from, of a guy in the army who was using, who was beating on a gun, like trying to get a pin out, with a 50 cal cartridge, a 50 BMG cartridge. Wow. And he didn't hit it with the bullet tip. He was holding the cartridge, and he hit it with the primer, and it turned his hand into hamburger. Well, he hit the primer. Don't hit the primer. The primer with rough handling or impact will go off. That's its whole purpose. There you go. So, there's, there's really no style of rough handling a cartridge that will cause a problem unless it is the primer that's included in the rough handling. Correct. So that round falling on the ground hit the primer. Yep. That gentleman, Bang. that soldier hitting it was hitting the primer. It was a horrible picture. I'm sure it was. Yeah. Sean M., if the original top-mounted charging handle on the AR-15 had made it to final production military adaptation, how would the platform have evolved in terms of optics mounting? Poorly. You can't even gooseneck that. More poorly. You can't even gooseneck that. Well, no. Oh, yeah, you can gooseneck it. Mounted charging handle, original top mark. No, you couldn't. Yeah. Where would you screw the screw in? The screw yeah, would be underneath. Yeah, flush-mounted thing. You, oh, yeah. they would have figured that out. You think so? Oh, yeah. All right, so they would have, you still could have goose mounted somehow. So, like, even the FAMAS, the FAMAS has a top charging handle, mm -hmm. and there are setups for mounting optics on it. They're really weird. Yeah, they're kind of crummy. Yeah. Um, they're, they involve putting a Picatinny rail in that um, sight trough. Which is, like, up here. It's it's pretty high. Yeah, now they did make later versions of the FAMAS that didn't really get anywhere, where they moved the charging handle from this to that. Right, and lowered that rail. And that's, I think, better. That's what would have um, happened. Probably. They would have eventually just moved it. Yeah. yeah. Or... Now, the question is, would they have moved it to the back where it is today? Or would they have just moved it to the side? I suspect a side charging handle probably would have been more likely. Which is what happened with the FAMAS. Yeah, sort of. Sort I'm thinking, of. like, take the charging handle out of the handguard. Oh. Out of the top. And drill a hole, a slot in the side. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There. Yeah. But it would have been much more difficult yeah. for optics. Yeah. Philip W. On the, in the two-gun match with the SCAR, you said there would be more content. Will there be? No. <laughs> Well, we had the mud test with the scar. We did, so that was the more content, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah that, but there wasn't any more to talk about. No, I think it was pretty much just that. It yeah, was that, the, the so, match and the mud test. We're not doing any more with the scar than that at this yeah. point. So, no, not really. Hunter G, what was the? This is for you, I think, but maybe. <laughs> okay. uh, what was the weirdest, most out of place weapon you've ever seen at a two gun match? It's got to be something oh, you brought. No, no, it's not. What is it? Uh, it was, I believe, Jordan brought it. Hmm? It was. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was an AK duct tape to a Mosin. Oh, and, he's brought two things then, because there was another one. Well, he actually ran that thing through an entire match and legitimately tried to use it. Failed badly uh, at everything with that thing. But it was, 
what was it? Was it an AK? I don't think it was an AK pistol. I don't recall. I think it was a folding stock AK. There was also the Obrez. He brought an Obrez mm. with a red dot on it, too. I think that was one of the matches I wasn't at. Okay, it, yeah. There's but, a video of me shooting that Obrez. Yeah, that was a match I wasn't at. Can't hit anything. Yeah. Can't well, hit anything. You just set the range on fire every time you pull the trigger, but you can't hit anything. You couldn't hit anything with this duct taped combo gun either <laughs> because the whole thing weighed about. 16 pounds and it was off center the thing was yeah it was a folding uh, stock still lighter than a bar it was a folding stock so you shouldered it with the mosin yes but you could shoulder it with the mosin and hold the the pistol grip of the ak to shoot the ak I, it was i remember it this really bad. it didn't work we did an april fool's day joke sort of thing on it giving yeah we it did some elbonian designation or something it did not work no, and was, so you you are actually not the weirdest gun nope although you've brought some weird ones i the Madsen was weird. That was cool. Yeah, yeah. I'd do that again. But yeah, that was it. And then he also brought that Obrez, which was a disaster. Yeah. Uh, Kyle C. Having seen your mud test on the Winchester rifle, well, this is kind of similar. Um, you, how do you think the lever gun could have seen? Could you think the lever gun could have seen service in the Great War? I'm curious how something like an 1866 Henry Carbine could have handled in a trench raid. Uh, yes, absolutely. Lever guns could have been in the Great War because they were. The Russians bought over 100,000 Winchester 1895s in 762 by 54 Yeah, they went not, rifle. Not quite the same thing as a pistol caliber carbine, uh, but by all accounts, they were very popular. Uh, they saw a lot of use because, you know, if, if someone dropped one, someone else picked it up. Now, that's also in comparison to 90, 1891 Mosins, yep. which are arguably <clears throat> one of the worst rifles of the war. Yep. So, you know, a sharp stick is maybe preferable to a, a poor Mosin. Yeah. Uh, I think a 66 could have done okay in trench raids. I think so too. I, I like we said earlier. I think it comes down to fragility. Yeah. Like people underestimate how how severe those conditions are, and you know we saw some of this at Desert Brutality. We did. We had a stage where you had to take a, a dummy water cooled machine gun with you through a stage. Big old beast of a thing. And you had to crawl through it, crawl through a tunnel with it, and people would take that thing and they just heave it literally into the mud. And sure, it's a dummy gun. It is effectively, for our purposes, just a weight. But I guarantee you, if some soldier is told, okay, you need to take that machine gun up to the lines, and they start getting shot at, that thing's getting heaved in the mud if that's what it takes to get not shot. Now we hear the comments about soldiers would never treat their weapons like this. Yeah. On top yeah, of that, would. at the same stage in the Desert Battalion match, and this is just a match, um, then they also have to retain their rifle with them. And yeah. those things got beat to shit, too. At least two of Two people blew up muzzle devices from, from mud. having mud in them. Yep, and there was it was a muddy environment, yeah. and so that, it's hard to once you have to crawl through mud, it's hard to avoid mud. It's kind of weird. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. and so it gives you a new appreciation for some of the the ruggedness of guns like the Mauser ninety eight mm -hmm. and the nineteen seventeen Enfield, which is sort of a Mauser ninety eight. Um, and I don't know that a Winchester lever action is quite up to that. Shout out to uh, C and Arsenal. Mm -hmm. They did an episode about the ninety five, and if I recall correctly. They were well liked, but they required a lot more maintenance. Okay, so Makes kind sense. of like what you're saying. Yeah, be careful with it. Yep. Uh, fiber optic. I love the old west vignette series. Any plans? I like the name, by the way. Fiber optic. That's cool. Spelt properly too. P H. Uh, and a K at the end. I love the old west vignette series. Any plans on a battle of the little bighorn, or also known as the battle of the greasy grass? It's been on the list forever. We'd love to. Yes. There, there are horseback tours of the battle that would be fantastic to do. I would love to do it. It's certainly an epic story um, from both sides of the perspective, and one that needs that that des deserves as much narration as can be provided. Yeah. Um, it's a uh, it's in a relatively remote part of the country, um, with not a lot around it. There's the there's some cool museums like the Cody Museum, but not a lot up there. And so it's kind of almost a dedicated trip it to, yeah, it would. to film just that. So I think it could happen, but I don't know when or where. Yeah. Well, I do know where, but I don't know when. Yeah. So, yes, someday. It's been on the list. Hopefully. It would be something I'd love to do. Callum B. Which, in your opinion, is a superior method of magazine insertion or retention? The AK's rock-in style or the AR's straight-in? Rock-in. Okay, why? I, I find it, well, it's, it's stabler. It is less likely to have problems. It's stronger. Yeah. It's not as fast. Nope. Okay, so you'd prefer the reliability of the, the rock-in over to the speed I, advantage I, of the straight-in? I think I do. Torn on this one. But you can mess up a rock in seat oh, too. Sure. And you can over insert a straight in. It's hard. Especially with the better magazines. Yeah, but if you do it, you're also going to damage the magazine. 
I'm gonna now, go. I should say, I don't have a huge preference here. It's not like I eschew one or the other. The question asks for a preference. I'm gonna go straight in. Okay. I'm gonna think. I think it. I think. I think that the issues with it from a reliability perspective have been assuaged, and that magazine design now gets rid of a lot of the issues, especially with things like PMAGs, and that the speed advantages are significant. Okay. And it's like if you've ever rocked an AK mag in wrong, it's a. Yeah, it can be bad. It's pretty annoying to get it out, um, and uh, that's not something that really happens with a straight in. So I'm gonna go straight in. So we're gonna disagree on that one. It's okay. It happens. Jonas G. During World War One, how common was it for a soldier to pick up and use an enemy weapon, say a German picking up a show shot, if they came across one? I would say simultaneously, extremely uncommon and also regular. So the idea of, like, moment of opportunity, I'm going to drop my Mauser and pick up an Enfield. Eh, not really. You gotta remember, all the accessories and gear you have on you are for the gun you're carrying, not the one you're picking up. Exactly. However, in particular with machine guns, it was absolutely policy to capture enemy machine guns and put them back into use. Turn them around even. Artillery as well. Yeah. yeah. So the Germans actually used Shoshas and especially used Lewis guns. Yep. Um, they're, and the Americans would use German machine guns as well. In fact, there's a pamphlet out there you'll occasionally see pictures of because it's cool. And it's this informational pamphlet circulated for American troops that is, it's titled, so you found a Bosch machine gun. What can I do with it? <laughs> I'd love or, so to see I that. found a Bosch machine gun. What can I do with it? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And so the heavier weapons in particular were absolutely captured and repurposed as a matter of course. Makes sense. Um, and apparently the Germans were big fans of the Lewis gun. Oh, for good reason. Uh, it was yeah. a good gun. Yeah. Um, and, and the Shosha, I think, to a lesser extent. Mm -hmm. But um, but people who who think about this from a video game perspective yeah where like you know i've got my rifle and then i get here and oh i can loot a whatever a schnellfeuer off of someone and that didn't really happen all the other like i said all the other ammunition and accessory gear is important yeah um and so you don't get to just drop your gun like if you come back without your rifle you're in in deep trouble yeah they don't still like, today they I don't mean, like that yeah where's your rifle i I got this thing. Even even like <laughs> British soldiers in Desert yeah. Storm who yeah. are saddled with L85A1s that are horrible guns that just don't work, they didn't get to drop them and pick up an AK. It's not how that so works. A few of them may have done it, but you kept your, your rifle because you're going to use that AK for whatever and then you're going to get rid of it. Because if you show up back in the line without your rifle, you're peeling potatoes for the rest of your life. Or worse. Yeah. So, fair enough. Um, Mauser dude, any opinions on storage compartments on a rifle, pistol grip, or stock? I never really use them. It's a great place to keep Skittles. Okay. If you need a Skittles break. Okay. No, but, yeah, I mean, sure, why not? I mean, if there's a space, if there's open space that can have a little lid that goes click, and you can put stuff in there, like batteries or other things like that, you're adding a little bit of weight to the gun, but, um, I think that they have merit. I think it's the sort of thing that gets, is more useful on, like, practical, actual military deployment. Yeah, of course. Hunting trips. If you're going to the range and back, no. Eh. But uh, but it, for for a practical rifle, that anywhere you can keep an extra battery for your optic yes. or whatever, or yes, your, that's or, very true. Or your light, yeah. Even more so, um, that matters. Yeah. Or a cleaning kit. Yeah. I mean, like From, the, the little like you know what? Here's a great example of the great use of this: the little tool kit that goes into the buttstock of an AK. Yeah, that is helpful. That little tool kit can completely disassemble the rifle down to the last bit and put it back together. Yeah. It's got those, you can adjust the sights, you can pull all the pins, you can put the pins back in, put the fire control group back together, all with that tool kit. That's true. And you can use it to clean with too and protect the muzzle in the process. That's an example of, oh yeah, a storage compartment being used in a very effective way. True. The ACAM tool kit's an amazing little, yeah. it's almost cooler than the rifle. I guess I'm really just looking at this from my own personal experience where that tool kit's great. But I don't need to keep it in the rifle. I can keep it in my range bag, which isn't necessary. That's not the, the context that the guns were designed for. I so. kept it in the rifle at Desert Brutality and actually used it because one of my screws was coming loose on the rifle. The, the world's crappiest rifle. Doesn't matter. The little tool in there was you useful. You fixed that problem. It was yes. useful. So, all right. Kind of need to have it there. Um, this came up a lot. Peter F. Why is the S333 volley fire not a machine gun under the NFA? If you did not watch our SHOT Show content about this, it is a revolver that when you pull this, it's got a trigger, it's like a paintball trigger, and if you pull the trigger, it fires two chambers at once in the cylinder with two barrels. Yeah, same thing for the Arsenal double 1911. It fires, so two rounds at once with one pull of the trigger. It is not an NFA item because that's called volley fire. The trigger activates two rounds simultaneously. 
that is different than a trigger activating more than one round in a, sequ in in a sequence. Yeah. So it's called volley fire, and the ATF considers that not an NFA restricted item. Yeah. Basically, because the ATF says it's not. It's not any different than having a coach gun and pulling both triggers at the same time. Yeah. Going back to 1880, yeah. whatever. Um, so they call it volley fire. That's why. It is. It's kind of interesting sometimes to see people get really obsessive about technicalities like that. Oh, there's been a million questions yeah. about it. That's why I threw it in there. Yeah. So because it's two rounds at the same time with one trigger pull, that's different. It just is. Yeah. It, okay. Lewis R. Why aren't there any modern top break revolvers? Because the non-solid frame is weaker. It is. Now, the last ones were really, what, the, the, the Webleys during World War II, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, and they, they were okay. I and mean, in... Well, the Webleys, both in 455 and in 38, are pretty darn low pressure rounds. They are, um, and you see it in a few others. You go back to the old West. You got the, yeah. the Smith and Wessons and the Schofield and all that. Schofields, yeah. And but, those were those were loaded to potent 45 caliber rounds, but they didn't do a Schofield in 45 Colts, though. No, they did it in 45 Smith and Wesson, which I don't, is, I don't think that was a weaker strength. cartridge. I don't think that was a strength issue. I think that was a proprietary maybe. thing. Maybe, but there might also be a reason nobody's built the, the top break revolver in 45 Colt. Well, or, or an open top revolver, for that matter. The reproduction of birdies are. Are they? Yeah. Oh, okay. I got you! I got you on one! <laughs> so you can get a, you can get a reproduction of birdie Schofield, and it's chambered in 45 Colt. Oh, okay. So it is possible. Okay. But ultimately, the reason is because having a solid frame is a substantially stronger gun. Yep. It's the same reason you see, like, you see the 1871 Richard Mason conversions, where they changed a cap and ball to a cartridge. Right. Then they went to the 1872 70, 72 open top, which is the same gun but without the top frame. And the, the improvement from there was the 1873 single action army. Right. And they added a frame, which was adding rigidity and strength. Yeah. That's the reason. Yep. Will W. How prolific were Gatling guns in the Old West? Not very. No. They're crazy expensive. Huge, too, and they had a lot of infrastructure around them. And took a lot of ammo. Mm -hmm. um, they were treated like artillery. They're horse drawn, mm -hmm. um, they're slow. The, arti the horses that the artillery got were not the best horses that were available. And there's an issue of terrain. Yeah. You're out, you're out, you're out in some place that's rugged, like here, not behind us, but a rugged mountainous area, and you've got Ugh. this gigantic thing. You're thousand like, pound gun. And you're like, big wheel. Ur, ur, and now you're trying to run it up is one yeah. thing, <laughs> down's <laughs> another, right? So, I mean, that kind of stuff's a problem. Yeah. That's, so they were... And the army never bought very many of them. They were around. I mean, they were, in today's, in today's terms, it would be tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. They were extremely expensive guns. Frankly, the Vickers and Maxim guns were extremely expensive guns, too. Yep, yep. So, so not very prolific. Yeah. The Army couldn't even afford ammo for training. Here's but, your round. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this was an interesting one, and I honestly don't have a good answer for this. Leslie W., how many, you have many times mentioned that the ACAM is the litmus test for designing stages, which I mentioned earlier. I don't recall that you've ever mentioned what your litmus test pistol is. I have, an, I have an answer for that. People aren't going to like it. No. Oh. The equivalent of the AK. The least modern gun that is still reasonably combat effective and okay. used. Yeah. 1911. Yeah, although I don't think about it while I'm doing it, and occasionally we've kind of gone a little bit higher on the round count than the 1911 can struggle with. But we occasionally go a little higher on the accuracy requirement that an iron-sided AK kind of struggles. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the 1911 would be the litmus test, and it really does fit that same niche statement of the lowest and still... Well, the most obsolescent but still practical firearm. Yeah. The AKM is on the rifle side and the 1911 will be on the pistol side. What about revolvers? Those have never worked well. well. I've never considered them as a consideration in two gun. Okay. I think that, that we're, that's in the environment we're in, um, the reload and capacity issues of revolver make it so that the stage designs would be so diminished in terms of their value to anything semi-automatic that they become okay. um, kind of ruined. Okay. So you're, you're, you're designing now at a level lower than most of the competitors would want to shoot at. Does that make sense? Yeah. The 1911, you know what? Yeah, it's got seven rounds, but what you can do is have a bag of mags. Yeah. Then uh, You can't do that with a revolver. Right. So if you're going to use a single stack thingamajig at two gun, bring a bag of mags. Yeah. And it's not uncommon for people to shoot with single stack. No, we see 1911s quite regularly, actually. And others. Yeah. We've seen toe grabs. We yeah. have Aaron, who's, who's, I've seen him shoot a P7 a bunch. Bring a bag with of mags. like six magazines on his he, belt. Yeah. He calls it his six pack. <laughs> He's got a six pack of mags. So, yes. Yeah. Travis R., do either of you individually or in range TV as a whole ever receive hate mail or backlash from the anti gun community in person, social media, or other forms of communication? The anti gun community doesn't really pay any attention to us. I, I, does Forgotten Weapons get any of that? 
Have you ever no. really, never really? Yeah. Honestly, the feedback I generally get from anti-gun people is along the lines of, wow, you've really opened my eyes. I, I don't yeah. really like guns, but this is actually really fascinating stuff. In range gets the same thing. Um, what I found interesting about this, and this is a deeper topic than we can ever deal with today in just the Q&A, but do we ever use hate mail or backlash from the anti-gun community? Um, no, oddly, the hate mail and backlash comes from the pro-gun community sometimes. And I don't understand that. We're eating our own a little bit on that. And if something isn't your cup of tea, okay. Proceed on. Be Sally forth and be safe. Um, that's the only requirement. So I don't know why, but if, I've, if, if I have, the only thing I've ever seen in terms of hate mail or backlash has never come from antis. It's come from pro. So you guys can figure out what that's all about. I don't know. Andrew C., as pistol red dots gain market share, do you think future pistols will be engineered for designs that allow for a non-reciprocating optic assembly? Yes. Not a lot. I think the problem is non a non-reciprocating fixed mount for an optic mm. is the best way to do an optic. A slide is the best way to make a semi-automatic pistol. And so you're going to see this clash of what, like Bruger and Tomet, mm. BNT, B and T um, did that with their USW. Yep. Which is now that incorporates a frame, uh, a shoulder stock, but their initial designs had a fixed optic mount, mm -hmm. and I think it was really good. Um, but it's not the best way to do a. It's like kind of awkward for a pistol. You know what I think the middle ground should be? Hmm. Fixed barrels, revolvers. No. Fixed fixed barrels, or rotating barrels. Yeah, but I don't know that that really makes... The problem is not so much... You're looking at the inherent accuracy. That yeah, that's what I care of. about. But the other issue is the durability of the optic, which has been addressed to some degree, but also the fact that if you have the sights not moving as the pistol fires, it will be easier to reacquire and, and shoot. For the red dot? I don't think it's a huge issue, but I think it is a real issue. And I think part of the reason mm. that... Maybe. Um, when it comes to iron sights... That's that's a real thing. The difference between I, I've shot carbine sort of submachine guns with the sights mounted on a reciprocating slide, and they're horrible. I could see I that think with a red dot. It's not so much of an issue, but I think it is an issue. Um, I suspect uh, ultimately the pistol design will win out, and you won't see much in the way of fixed. I th I think the red dot reliability has become a thing with the Delta Point Pro and the now the Acro. The Acro. That is, these things aren't going to fail. And if it, I, this is just me. And so if you can make a red dot that ain't going to fail, and you can put it on a gun where you have a fixed barrel or a rotating barrel instead of a tipping barrel, I think that would mitigate a lot of the things that we see with ammo changes and zero shift and inherent accuracy. And I'm not so sure I'm sold on it being an issue that it's reciprocating with a red dot. I think the, the zero shift is, is an overblown problem. Mm. I, think, I think people will, will tinker. I think fixed optic mounting pistols will come out, and I think ultimately they will lose out in the mainstream competition too traditional pistol designs with an optic on a reciprocating slide. In my, expe in my experience, changing ammunition types on a red dot sight mounted pistol will result in um, um, elevation shift. Well, it does on the iron sight. Yeah, more too. than you'd expect, though. It's not going to change it any differently based on the type of sight. Yeah, but you, you just, your you're, accuracies... You're, you're, you're more able to exploit the accuracy so you see it. Correct, and that's why I'm saying fixed barrel or rotating barrel might mitigate that. All right, uh, Thomas M. Why do you abuse the guns you use or test by throwing them on the ground? It hurts to see it. Because we don't like them. Right, we don't like guns. That's not it at all. Um, what it boils down to is, for me, I'm curious what your thoughts are. And mm -hmm. um, So throwing them on the ground, such as, all right, we've done this, put it over the side, in a safe environment, of course, where it's like already cleared or whatever. Um, the, the, I see these guns, for the most part, I mean, there's collectibles. We've got some stuff mm -hmm. that's collectible that's different, but these things like an AKM or an AR-15, these things are cordwood. They're tools that are used for a purpose. The purpose is A, in our video, maybe doing a mud test, which has already been through hell and back already, so what's the difference? Or in a two-gun match, where the gun gets so beat up and, and, and used in the way it does anyway, that what's the difference if I toss it on the ground or not? The AKM that I used at Desert Brutality, it looks like modern art at this point. I mean, it is like there's like lines and scratches and stuff all over it because it's being used as a tool in a competitive or training environment. And those environments, we don't care about the surface finish. They dictate that the guns get abused, like yeah. they just do. And if it's not something that's historically significant or collectible, it's just a tool. I think there's an interesting 
dichotomy in people who look at the gun and think, ah, this is a rugged military firearm. Yep. And that's part of its quality, is that it's suitable for serious military use. Yep. But then also would would cringe at it being dropped onto the dirt. It's yep. like, that is military durability. That's what it's there for. Mm -hmm. And as you say, if, if, if there's a reason to try and preserve the finish of the gun and yep. its aesthetics, absolutely. I mean, I, you don't see me doing that with my FAMAS. Right, well, there's um, a reason for that. Yeah. However, if it's just a run-of-the-mill AK, like, I, to me, it actually is, is kind of a deliberate thing to remind people that, like, this is how these things are actually designed to be handled. Like, I know you'll get in trouble for doing it, but the gun designer has to make it so that that won't hurt the gun. I find it interesting that people, and I've seen, and Thomas, I'm not pointing at you with this, I've seen people say that it hurts to see it, and I don't quite understand that, because I really legitimately mean this, and I know we're going to hear comments about it, but it's like, they really are just tools. Our perspective may be a bit different than a lot of, of viewers, okay. because we have access to a lot of guns, and they're a very normal thing, and it, for you in particular, ARs really are kind of like cordwood. I, I'm not like, trying to be sarcastic when I say that they're cordwood. There yeah. are a lot of people for whom they're not. Okay. For whom I am lucky to have access to one. Yeah. And I treat it as well as I possibly can because it has a special place and it's a hard, it, it, it's a valuable thing to have in both a economic and in an emotional sense. Okay. And I don't want to abuse it and, you know, and it, it, it makes me feel like someone else is wasting the potential. Well, that other person's perspective is these things are kind of like cordwood and they're readily accessible. And if I ever want another one, I just get a different one. I fully understand that. And I agree. And I'm not saying that people should abuse anything they own. I'm not saying that at all. But, what, but the things that we're using and the way we're using them, especially, even if it's a nice AR, once you're done with a couple Desert Battalion matches, it's going to look beat up. Beat up. Whether you threw it or not, no matter how much you gingerly handle it, this, the, what we do with it at certain training events or match environments are going to um, put a lot of field wear on that gun. And I think that in the nature of just tossing it on the ground during the video, isn't something we're telling you that you should do. No. It's also never done thoughtlessly. No. If you see us do it, we intend to do it. We thought about doing it. We have considered, what is this gun? What am I dropping it onto? Um, like, when we threw the VZ, when you threw the VZ-52 into the dumpster, yeah. you know, we looked in that dumpster first, and that dumpster was full of garbage bags full of basically paper detritus from yep. magazine, from paper targets and, and ammo boxes and, you know, some water bottles. Hmm. And honestly, that was an incredibly soft surface to throw the rifle on. You can't see that in the video. You just see it go into a dumpster. Yeah. But we didn't just do that at random. No, that video was a joke. But there's like in the upcoming Desert Brutality series we're talking, I'm just like out of the AK and I'm tired of holding it. I was going to toss it to the side. Literally, just I was tired of holding it. I was tossed it to the side safely. There was a burn behind me, unloaded gun, even having a flanger chamber flag in it. But that gun had already been through eight stages of Desert Brutality. Ain't going to get hurt more. Like, it just isn't. And and I think it is a, it is a somewhat, it's a somewhat demure message that don't forget that these these guns are designed as tools. Yeah. And doing that is uh, a reminder that that's what they're there for, and maybe you only have one and you should take care of it, I understand that, but they are designed to be tools. And I can say that of all the guns we've ever tossed on the ground, how many have we broken? None. Zero. How many have lost zero? None. None. That's the reason, right? It doesn't. That's just not how these things work. And if it did, that thing sucks. If, <laughs> if, I could, if I could go whoop, and toss that on the ground over there, I don't want that gun if it broke. Something's wrong with it because that's, that's not, it's not going to make it. It's not going to make it in the yeah. way we use it or the way that it was designed to be used for. Yeah. So that's the reason. It's not a totem. It's a tool. Exactly. So that's that. And All that's right. it. All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching however long this was. And thank you to the Patreon supporters for being there and making InRange a thing and for supplying us questions. If you're not one of them already, please consider it. Um, we have all sorts of different perk levels, and $5 and above is what gets you into this. $3 above, you get into the Buyers Club, where we've got cool codes, uh, where that saves you money on all sorts of different manufacturers and stuff. Brownells, cool KE Arms, yeah. We Plead the Second. There's a whole litany of them, and that's kind of neat. Um, and you're supporting a channel that hopefully you're watching this now, you're enjoying and appreciate. Um, if you can't do that, totally get it. Subscribe to one of us on uh, subscribe to us on one of our many distribution channels. You can find them all on inrange.tv.